right. So we hopefully have several people that will want to ask questions. I do want to speak to the audience first. I know several of you have other obligations that will take you from here. So do keep in mind, we recognize that. Uh, if you need to leave for practice or a class at four, we totally understand. It's completely fine to quietly leave, but we do encourage you to stay as long as you can. If you do have questions to ask, I do encourage you to state your name and where you're from. I was telling Ms. Eisenhower that we have people from all over the country, so please do let her know where you're from, and I do encourage you to ask questions. That's a large part of why we're here today. Right, and if they leave early, I'm going to take it very personally. Well, I would too, but we'll, we'll try and keep that under control, because um, you'll always have me, so we're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Is, this, is it working? No, I didn't think so. It's, te it's telling me low battery. So, it's a new battery. Well, I can just hold it like I'm. No. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I want to kick things off and ask a question that maybe all of you would find fascinating. My question for you is: Tell us maybe your favorite childhood White House memory. Well, um, I think you all might have seen a picture of it, but for my sixth birthday party, my kindergarten class. Um, came to the White House with me, um, and they gave me a Huckleberry Hound Dog stuffed dog about that big, and it was hidden um, in the library of the White House, and they made me find it. So I was going all over the place, but I, I finally did. Um, Huckleberry Hound Dog and I were united. So that was a great birthday. <laughs> did they get? that your grandparents were in the White House? You you said last night that you just thought your grandparents lived in a big house. Did, did. they get that they lived in the White House, that your grandfather was president? Like, were you the only person oh, that didn't get it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the other, um, everybody came in kind of their Sunday best, and um, my birthday is December 21st. I won't say what year, but um, um, they, they um, so there, there were two-story Christmas trees actually in the in the White House in the in the official on the official floor. So we have a great um, picture of that. But yeah, I I always just thought that my grandparents lived in a in a big house, you know, until, until I got into school and things were a little strange. Apparently, but, yours uh, is not working. Yeah. No, it's not. Just turn yours off. Hello. Okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, it. <laughs> It became a rude awakening to me when I, I went back later, of course I knew then, um, and I went down to uh, the ladies' room, which was down on the ground floor, and I walked in and there were these crystal sconces on the wall, and I went, oh, Mimi left, Mimi left her sconces. <laughs> and then I realized, no, she never owned them to begin with, so. <laughs> All right, we've got an opportunity for you guys to ask some questions. Don't let me take all of the time. <laughs> All right. Well, this can just be the Christy or... and Mary show. It's fine by me. All right. So uh, you grew up spending a lot of time at the White House weekends and evenings. You mentioned that uh, sometimes you were late getting home because you were hanging out with the grandparents. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with your grandfather. What did a normal day when you went over there look like? Oh, you mean when we were living on the um, edge of the farm? Um, and this was after he retired. Um, and I'd come home from school and I'd usually uh, mosey over that way. And um, I really hung out with Dolores and Moni, who were a, a married couple that um, uh, Sergeant Moni had been with Granddad during World War II and he stayed with him um, even after he got out of the Army. And they, they were like family, so I'd hang out with them. And um, then I guess, I suppose, you know, I would obligatory go and see uh, the grandparents but I was really more concerned with hanging out with them and um, then it usually get dark and they'd have to walk me home so what a day at the White House for you look like the day at the White House was usually um, uh, I would uh, wake up in the morning and there there was uh, my grandmother had like a um, I don't know what you would call it a, a, a lady's lady if, if that's right uh, she would help her pick out her clothes and you know things like that and she was Irish and she had just the she was a beautiful lady and she, she just had this wonderful accent and I loved her to death but I would wake up on the third floor of the White House and I would go straight to the 
to the quarters where um, the people who worked there slept, and I'd go to her room, and she was always having tea, and she would she would butter up some toast and sprinkle sugar on it, which I was not supposed to have. <laughs> so she and I got along just just fine. <laughs> but um, I would do that, and then um, I would go to my grandmother's room. She stayed. Um, she had a rheumatic heart, so she would stay in bed till noon every day because when she got her rheumatic heart, they didn't have like antibiotics and they couldn't fight it, so she just lived with how it left her. And um, so in order not to make people feel bad that she was in, in bed, she would say, all ladies ought to be able to stay in bed until noon. And she said, and at least once a month, they ought to be able to stay in bed all day. Um, but she outlived the thing by about 40 years, so she, she did very well. Uh, but I would go to her room and she always did her correspondence from bed, you know, that, that was when she did her, her administrative work, you know, she planned menus and uh, she actually, I think now they have, I don't know how many on staff to run the White House, you know, to manage it, you, you know, like the housekeeping, that kind of thing. She ran the White House. She she was, um, so she, she did a lot of um, what we would call executive things now um, that she just did because she was his wife, <laughs> you know. and. Um, so she would do all the, you know, she'd plan all the menus and things like that uh, from her room. And uh, there, there was one time, um, she had a mechanical bird in there that was in a, a cage. It was yellow and it was like a canary and if you wound it up it would chirp. And it was really kind of obnoxious sounding, I realized, but she was very patient with me. I loved that thing. and I. Um, she, she used to say that it was like the bird she had when she was a little girl, and um, I guess her bird's name was Peep, which was kind of popular in those days, I don't know. But, um, so she, she really liked the thing too, and I, uh, one time I was winding it and winding it and winding it, and all of a sudden it wouldn't chirp. I overwhelmed that bird. And I was frantically trying to do something to fix it because I, you know, I, I really didn't want to experience her wrath. And, um, she kind of looked up over her glasses, you know, she had these half glasses for reading. And I mean, there, there was steel coming from her eyes. <laughs> and she said, what happened? And I said, uh, he's not working. Needless to say, <clears throat> I wasn't welcome in the room that morning. And uh, so I just kind of hung out in my, my upstairs room. And uh, when my grandfather got back from quote unquote the office, I never realized it was the Oval Office. He was just coming home from work, and um, I headed her off at the at the elevator to meet him. And I started explaining what happened right away. I mean, I was going a mile a minute because I didn't want her to get me in trouble. And um, he just kind of looked at me confused, and he said, "Well, I, you know, I think this can be worked out." And I, I said, "No, no, the the bird's dead. The bird's dead." You know, and I was just really hysterical so um, you know I managed to she got up about the time he came in too and she gave him her side and he looked much more concerned at her than he did at me uh, but anyway to make a long story short um, I went to bed that night when I woke up the next morning there was a yellow bird in a cage a mechanical bird at the bottom of my bed and I went Oh, if she catches me with him in here, I'm really going to be in trouble. So I scooped the bird up and I ran to um, their bedroom on the second floor. And um, there was another one in front of her door. And uh, so somewhere in the middle of the night, Granddad found two more birds, identical. <laughs> and uh, he settled it. <clears throat> and I told my father, you know, I showed it to my father and I was all excited and he said, yes, some poor old aide had to go out in the middle of the night and find those birds. <laughs> anyway. Tell them the golf cart story. Golf. The White House golf cart. You uh, saw it when attended? Oh, no, when that's attended. one I told last summer. Yes, you threw me yes, off. Yes. Well, um, the, um, the Mark's Toy Company um, gave us the four, uh, I have two sisters and a brother, and um, I'm the youngest and my brother's the oldest, so when it came time for like pecking orders and that kind of thing, I was always last on the list, um, which if you know any baby of the family, they, they all feel that way. Um, but uh, the Marks, um, or, um, yeah, the Marks Toy Company gave us a, an, an electric Thunderbird. Does anybody know what a Thunderbird is? The car? Okay. And it, it you know, it, it, it was like a golf cart, 
uh, in that it had a rechargeable battery in it and all that would probably go about two miles an hour, but, um, you know, it was exciting and everybody else kept getting their, their turn on it. And when it would come to my turn, we always had something else we had to do and all that, and I was like, you know, ah. uh, but I'm sure it's because I was too young, really, to, to be operating it. Well, finally, one day, everybody was off doing something else. My sister was, um, my sisters were like dance and my brother was at school and the Thunderbird was parked in the diplomatic driveway, the circular one that goes around the front of the White House. And the key was in it. And I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> my turn had finally arrived. <laughs> so I jumped in the car and I, I turned it on. And I kind of did some donuts involuntarily. I didn't, you know, two mile an hour once it was harmless. But um, <clears throat> next thing I knew, there was this palm like this. And it was a White House guard. He said, excuse me, ma'am, did you know that you were speeding? <laughs> and, you know, I think I was like four or five years old. And I'm, I'm like, uh, no. And he wrote me a faux ticket. You know? <laughs> and I was sure that I was dead meat by, the, you know, because there were several things you didn't do around my grandfather. You didn't break the law. And if I was speeding, I'd broken the law. So that was a big deal. And he didn't lie. So, you know, like I had to tell him. So, you know, there, there, there were a couple of things going on here, but finally, um, uh, once again, he was coming off the elevator, coming back from work, and I headed him off. I headed everybody off, and um, I told him what had happened, and uh, he said, well, yeah, he thought that I should be punished, that I, I, I could not have a, a driver's license for at least 11 years. <laughs> so, and that's the way it worked out. Any questions in the audience? I could go on. All right. So, uh, with you traveling the world and doing a lot of humanitarian quiet work, what was the meaning of life to me to you? What was the question? Uh, the question was, what is the meaning of life after, um, you know, I've been to all these countries and done all this humanitarian work? And um, I really believe um, there are very few people that don't have any good in them. I can't imagine anybody that doesn't, uh, maybe Jeffrey Dahmer. But um, to me, uh, I have seen people partner together to help something that it's not even their problem. You know, like the landmine thing that I mentioned this morning. Um, and people are so passionate about helping each other. And, and you don't realize that because it doesn't get any media attention and it doesn't you know, the good things don't come out. And I really believe that we're all truly, truly connected by the heart. I, you know, um, when I used to talk to high school students, I would um, tell them, you know, you might get somebody from Asia, you might get somebody from Africa, you might get somebody from Europe, and you might get some, somebody from South America, somebody from the United States. They all look different, they all dress different, they all eat different, they talk different. But at the end of the day, if you pull their hearts out, they're identical. So it, it's really one big race, and it's a human race, and I believe we're all brothers. I really do. Brothers and sisters, sorry. Why do you feel like you're looking for a lot of media attention? Well, the sad part is we're, we're entering into an era, you know, and I, I remember from before this era, I remember when they were reporting on what the First Lady was wearing for Easter, you know, and that, that's just not going to happen today. But um, it doesn't sell. It doesn't sell. The, the good news doesn't. You know, uh, they want to keep people glued to whatever it is, you know, whether it's their device or whether it's TV or whether it's a newspaper. Yeah. You know, and that's the sad part. It's, it's, it's like um, tragedy has become commercialized, and that's, that's what really um, the people to people, I say movement, because really what I'm in is not called people to people now, but um, it's still the same principle. But um, that's what that fights. You know, it, it, it's the good news whether it gets attention or not. Why don't you go ahead and talk about what you're doing now, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'm with an organization called Outreach International, and we, um, <coughs> our sole mission is to um, a, a sustaining solution to poverty. And so um, we go, we're, we're in, active in eight countries right now. We have um, 16 that we've worked in, and we still visit the other eight. Um, you know, as, as a follow-up, but it's, it's sustaining good. In other words, um, 
you know, I think we're really lucky in this country because we don't know what real, real poverty is. You know, um, real poverty is when you're um, using a, a latrine that's behind um, some hung up shredded paper and um, everything's going into the ground and getting into the groundwater and making people sick and stuff like that. You know, so we go in with different solutions depending on what the problem is. Even, even cooking, believe it or not, um, most people in, shall we say, recovery countries or developing countries, um, they, they will cook in very primitive conditions like with, with wood but no ventilation in the kitchen. And so the women primarily, because they're primarily the cooks, um, end up getting COPD and things like that, and the, the kids get asthma because it's all in the house, and it's it's uh, worse than any kind of secondhand smoke we could imagine. And so we go in, and you know, it's it's not um, it's not a modern splashy stove, but um, it's one with ventilation. You know, we, we teach them how to do it. They pay for it, and they pay us back. Um, so it's it's they take ownership of their own problems, and they also take ownership of the solutions. And that does a lot of um, good in that it, it um, uh, first of all, we're not coming in and telling them how to do it and saying, you know, and just handing them something and saying, okay, well, we're better than you and, and you know, good luck. You're teaching them how to fish, right. Uh, but, but more than that, because um, if you could see the people who are what we call past participants that have already kind of, they've, they've actually gotten water into their, into their homes and things like that. And when, when I say home, it's still maybe one or two rooms and maybe six people are living there, but on the same token, um, they now have water coming in so they don't have to um, go to the rivers and you know, they, they'll uh, carry it on their heads up mountains and things like that. Um, there's a solution, it's clean. Um, the latrines are, um, you know, they're sanitary, uh, as opposed to the old system that I described, and the with the stoves and things like that. Um, there's ventilation that gets it out of the out of the kitchen, and, and everybody's healthier. And when they talk about, you know, because they, they do it themselves, we coach them, but they do it themselves, and um, we give them the the seed money, but they have to pay it back at a very low interest rate. But if they if they went into uh, like their own towns and, and borrowed the money, um, it's like loan sharks. You know, it's 60% interest and things like that. And they, they get to where they can't pay anything but the bank. Um, and that's that's where it becomes kind of a catch-22. But um, the, the pride and the happiness, and um, a lot of them have started small businesses, you know, and, and um, you know, they might make you know, thirty dollars a month or something, but that's huge, and they're saving their money to add another room to their home. And they're, um, you know, it, instead of dirt floors, they have concrete floors, and instead of um, um, just gaping holes, they, they have something at the window, you know, and, and things like that. And they're they're excited, and they're they're moving forward, and they're doing it themselves. So, yes, ma'am. That was a long answer, wasn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your name and where are you from. I'm Courtney. I'm from California. And what made you like interested in this? And what made you like pursue that one? Well, it kind of started when I was with uh, people, the People International. Um, I, it was weird. I, I got an email one morning, and from a Donna Hopkins, and I had no idea who she was, and it just said, "What is your relation to the Eisenhower Foundation, and uh, does it provide funding to People to People?" So I was the CEO of People to People, and you know how people are always all over the CEO's activities and things like that. I thought, whoa, this is loaded. And I wrote back and I said, who are you and why do you want to know? <laughs> and so she wrote back and she said she was with the, actually the State Department and um, she was working on the eradication of landmines and um, she said it just looked like a real bridge builder and she was wondering if we would want to get involved with um, kind of a coalition of non-government organizations that, that would work on this landmine problem. And, you know, I thought about it. I, you know, you, you forget that when the war is over, the damage isn't, you know, and um, 
Landmines are really sinister because they make them look like toys so that kids will pick them up. And the idea is not to, not to kill people, but to maim them so that you clog up the system. You know, that's pretty bad. And so I thought, yeah, you know, that, that, that is something I'd really like to get involved in. And we did. And then when I was going to recovering and developing countries on those things, then I saw the rest of it. And it was like, no, you know, I, what, I, what I took away from my first visit to Sri Lanka was, no, everybody, I don't care whether you're this high or this high, everybody deserves something warm to wake up in and something to eat when they do wake up. You know, they, they, that, that's just a basic, that's not even a need, that, that is just something you should have without question. And I just, uh, I can't stand the idea of somebody being hungry. You know, it, it, it truly bothers me because it's just not right. So that's, that's where that came from. <laughs> it all started with some Donna Hopkins that I didn't know. <laughs> Hey, Donna. Delaney. Yes. Uh, I'm Delaney. I'm from and I know it's hard to pick a favorite from where all have you traveled to and which ones you I've traveled to um, now 75, if you include Nicaragua, which I just got back from uh, a week ago. 75 countries, uh, six continents. I haven't made Antarctica yet. Um, but there's a lot of frozen people there, but I'm not sure there's too many hungry. <laughs> um, but um, I think just sheer volume, it would be Egypt. I've, I've been to Egypt uh, 29 times. Before, but that was before the first re revolution. And they've had two revolutions since I was there. Uh, 2011 was the last time I was there. So um, it's, it's a magical place. Um, everybody, you know, there, there's, the people have a great sense of humor and um, they're very accepting of other ways. You know, and, and um, there's Muslim, uh, Jewish, and Christians, at least before the, before the Muslim Brotherhood came in. Um, and they were all, it was a peaceful coexistence. It was really a, a great situation. And um, I just always loved it there. I felt at home. I thought maybe one of my past lives, maybe I was, you know, one of the Shebas. <laughs> I don't know. Yes? Uh, my name is Brittany. I'm from Missouri. Oh, uh, where? Uh, the Kansas City area. Haha, -ha, where? Blue <laughs> Springs. I live in Independence. Oh, do you really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> That's great for neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering, um, do you have any advice for somebody who's interested in becoming a Christian and wants to get into the humanitarian work? Um, I think that the biggest Yes. You have to have an open mind. You have to be flexible, um, and you have to be very, very sensitive of other ways, um, because some of the things that you do may be an insult to somebody else that you don't even think about, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so before you even start to help, you, you really have to familiarize yourself with the culture of the area that you're interested in or that, that you think you want to go into. and. Um, You've also got to be prepared because um, a lot of times you'll leave a site and you just come unglued, you know, because you've seen something really bad, you know. Um, but it was kind of funny as an example of what I'm talking about, just simple things. Um, I was in Rwanda and we were working, you know, uh, there was a terrible genocide there. I don't know, I guess I think you all are too young to probably remember it. Um, but I was there about 10 years after the, the genocide. We started, out of 4 million um, people under 18, 2 million were homeless because their parents had been killed and most of them were there and maybe they played dead or something like that and that's how they survived. Um, and it, it, it was a, uh, a, a good example of what colonialism, you know, uh, the exit of colonialism did to uh, a country because it was because of the occupation afterwards that's what started the civil war and um, but anyway the the homeless people it's interesting because they um, very cheerful beautiful smiles you know they're happy one of the things that excited them was we had digital cameras and we take their pictures or take their pictures with us and then we show them the picture on the back of the camera and they were like you know they were just thrilled, you know, and uh, so we also had 
Polaroid cameras, and we'd give them uh, their picture because they had no other record. And um, it was funny, we were going from, you know, K Kagawi and, <laughs> pardon me, blah, blah, <laughs> Kagawi uh, into a different, you know, deeper into the, the country. Um, and we had stopped for, to get some bottled water. <coughs> and I was sitting in the car, uh, I didn't go in, and the guy that was driving us was in there with me, and I saw this just beautiful man, and he, obviously he was a, they call themselves street people, it's not derogatory, um, but he was homeless, um, but he was just, he was probably, I'd say 21 at the most, and he was just kind of walking with a bounce in his step, and he smiled at me, and I smiled and waved at him like that, and he jumps in the car, <laughs> and I went, no, oh. um, so I thought, maybe he wants me to take his picture with a digital camera, so I clicked his picture, and I showed it to him, and he smiled, and he got out of the car, and, you know, just kind of waved goodbye. So I waved goodbye, he jumps in the car again. <laughs> and finally the driver turned around and said, Madam, if you want to wave, you have to do this. This means come here. <laughs> so it's just little things that you have to learn. Um, and I, you know, how in this country we go, okay, well, that's like, you don't do that in Egypt. It, it, it's pretty bad, and I didn't know until after I'd been going for like five years, somebody finally said, Mary, you know, because the language barrier, you know, a lot of times I go, you know, like, thank you, and they were, Mary, you really don't want to do that, and I'm like, why? Well, thumbs up works. <laughs> so, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Do you have a particularly moving D-Day story you've heard from a vet or even from your grandfather? Well, I had an interesting experience. I was there for the um, 60th anniversary, and um, I was at Point de Hoc, and I was just kind of, I was wandering around with the, I, I traveled with one of my colleagues to it, and um, I was just kind of wandering around, and I went to uh, the actual, there's like a monument that hangs over one of the cliffs, and I'm not kidding, I don't know how, um, the the men got up the, the cliffs because they were they were like that. But they scaled them and got up somehow. Soon they're just kind of pondering because you know when you're in Normandy, it's it's hallowed ground. It's it's really um, you know there's there's just kind of a blanket, and you know you know what happened and, and uh, you know how many people lost their lives and it's really very moving to be there. So uh, I was standing and watching the the sea and and kind of trying to size up what, what they must have gone through. And this vet walked up to me and stood beside me, and we were quiet for a while. And he said, um, he said, yeah, I was one of the ones that had to clean out the woods before D-Day. And um, I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, um, he said there were, I don't know how many in his unit, but there were only five survivors. Only five lived through that exercise. And he said, now three of us uh, are alive from the, that five. And he said, but you know, we would have done about anything for Ike. He didn't know who I was. And um, I just kind of sat there. And my friend started to introduce us. And I went like that because I wanted, I wanted to hear what he actually had to say about it. And um, so listening to his story and hearing it firsthand, and then hearing what I did about my grandfather, um, sorry, I still get kind of emotional about it, but that was probably the most touching thing that's... That's your answer. <laughs> that's so. amazing. What other questions do you have? Yes. Um, I'm Erin. I'm from Missouri also. Oh, really? Yeah, the Springfield area. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but what piece of advice do you think your grandfather would give to our generation? Well, I think that he would he would count on um, your resilience because they're, they're, we've got a lot going on right now, um, and I think that he would also point out that this is not the worst time in our history, and you need to know that um, we've survived and gone through a lot, you know, as much if not more, um, and we've come out on on top. Mankind has come out on top all the time. 
and he would, um, you know, there, there were a couple of things that he wouldn't tolerate. One, one was deceit. You know, he always felt like if you, if you stayed on the level, then everything was going to be all right. Um, and um, believe it or not, he deplored politics. <laughs> he really hated them. And um, in fact, when he left office, uh, he asked President Kennedy, instead of keeping the title president, if he could have the title general back. And President Kennedy said yes. So he, he um, went by general the rest of his life. Um, but he, he would be, um, I think more than anything, he would want you to know that the horrible things that you hear about, you know, the ISIS and, you know, all these just what I consider to be nightmarish things, um, that's not the norm. That's, uh, you know, 98% <coughs> of the United States does not have a police record. Did you know that? 2% have a police record. And those are the ones that get all the attention. So you've got, you've got, to, you've got to bring out in, into the light what, we, what you and I know. You have to keep that hope going. Because hope's it. You know, if you, if you have that, you can go through anything. Those were kind of my words, not his, but I think that's what he would <laughs> go for. <laughs> Tell the uh, oh, um, I'm Hannah, and I'm from Illinois. Um, what is of all the people we've met, who is one of the most interesting people? Oh gosh, um, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Orlando, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> she had his picture because they probably have at least seen him. You know, they just don't know that they know who Tony Orlando is. Yeah, Tony Orlando, like I said this morning, he's uh, a singer from the 70s who's in his 70s now. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, he's an inspirational type of person, believe it or not. He, he, was a, he was a rock star, you know, back in our day. Um, in fact, I had all of his uh, pictures all over my you know, posters. But him I and have the monkey. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Him and the monkeys are the people that I had on my bedroom walls. And, um, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Mickey Dolan's was my, yeah, not David Jones, Mickey. <laughs> but, um, he, uh, I guess it was uh, when the MIAs came back from, um, or the POWs, excuse me, came back from Vietnam. He sang uh, Tie a Yellow Ribbon at the, at the, um, uh, Super Bowl that year in their honor and um, he just fell in love with the vets and so he and I have worked a lot together on veterans projects and what I can't believe is he's really showbiz meets nice he's just such a super super person but he, he really goes deep because he is first generation uh, Puerto Rican and Greek so he, he calls himself a Greek or Rican <laughs> <laughs> but, um, He's just got a heart that, that you wouldn't expect out of somebody like that because he was he was an idol in his day, um, and it was kind of funny the way I met him. Um, my father wrote me an email, and he said, "Mary, what are you doing on Veterans Day?" Because Tony Tony throws veteran shows every single Veterans Day, and um, it's for free, uh, which is truly wonderful that he does that, and he he honors the veterans and. And he, he also works on side projects, like he helps them get prostheses and uh, that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so he said, what are you doing on Veterans Day? And I, I wrote back, I had just gone with people to people, and I was coming in from Taiwan on the 10th of November. Veterans Day is the 11th. And I said, well, I, I don't know, sleeping. I, you know, Taiwan's like a 15-hour time difference. I'm sure I'm going to be in bed. And he wrote back and he said, well, some joker named Tony Orlando wants to honor your grandfather. And I thought, oh, you haven't been in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I about fell off my chair when I was reading the email. Um, and he said, everybody else is busy. You're right there in Missouri. He's in Branson. Uh, we think you need to go and accept the honor. And I wrote back and I said, Daddy, I really can't. I, I can't. I'll, fall, I'll embarrass myself. I'll fall asleep in my spaghetti, you know wrote back and he said, so glad you can make it. <laughs> so I went straight from Taipei, Taiwan to Branson, Missouri to accept wow. this award. But as soon as I met him, I realized what a special, special person he was. That he 
was probably one of the most interesting because, you know, he, he's got such a, you know, he, he came from um, less than fortunate circumstances and, you know, kind of lived the American dream, if you will. And Gary Sinise. And Gary Sinise, too. Yeah, he's, an, he's another, uh, has anybody ever seen CSI New York? Mm-hmm. Forrest Gump, too. Mm -hmm. That was probably one of, his, yeah. Yeah, that was one of my favorite roles of his. But he um, partnered with uh, People to People when I was CEO um, on a, a, a program called Operation International Children. It was called Iraqi Children, because that's when it started, was during the Iraqi conflict. And uh, we gathered school supplies and sent them um, to the children of uh, Iraq and then Afghanistan um, because they, you know, he had visited with USO and realized that, that the kids in school there were actually three on a pencil. And I said, oh really? Well, they're doing better than Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka doesn't have pencils at all. But anyway, so this program was set up that, that we would send the supplies to the troops and the troops would distribute them. And it, it you know, the, the scary guy in the camouflage became a friend to the kids. You know, it really built bridges, and um, uh, I think by the time the program wound down, uh, we had distributed about 650,000 kits. And um, he is just, he's another one, he's Hollywood meets nice, he's just a, a really good person. And once CSI got canceled, um, he started his own uh, foundation, and he now builds uh, smart houses for veterans you know, where the stoves will lower so that you can cook from a wheelchair and um, different things, you know, like you can do that and the lights come on, you know, if you don't have two hands or, you know, if you can't get to, you know, just really fascinating houses actually. And um, he, he's given them to different veterans for free. And it comes out of his pocket as <coughs> his foundation. So those are two of the interesting people in the current <laughs> as opposed to, I can tell you about a lot of them from like 50 years ago, but I don't, <laughs> I don't have to explain who they are. <laughs> tell the sanitary de Gaulle story. The sanitary one. Yes, oh. yes. You know, I know, I know, I really am not. I've got two, uh, how many know who Charles de Gaulle was? Okay, we'll have to, <laughs> we'll we have some explaining to do here. <laughs> we're, we're getting there in my history classes. Yeah, that's we'll okay. But during World War II, of course, you know, there, there was uh, a great, um, at, they called themselves the Allies, and it was uh, France, Russia, um, England, United States, and we were all the ones that were together fighting World War II. Um, <coughs> I'm at least talking about the European campaign, and the, the, the one from France was um, Charles de Gaulle, and um, he didn't really come to light until France was liberated from the Nazis. Um, but then he, he became the player, he actually became president of uh, France. So if I back up a little bit, kind of in people to people style, um, when heads of state would come uh, to the United States, Granddad wanted, him to, wanted them to see something outside of um, the big cities as, as America. He wanted them to see farmland and things like that. In fact, there's some great pictures of the farm uh, of him with the king of Pakistan pinching uh, a cow's ear. <laughs> I don't know what they were talking about, but they were they were definitely discussing ag agriculture. And um, so, anyway, Charles de Gaulle in uh, 1958, how about that, and I remember it, <laughs> um, came to the farm. He was on a, an official state visit, and um, we lived right on the edge of the farm, so um, it was kind of a progressive dinner. Uh, he came for um, hors d'oeuvres and, and stuff before dinner to our house and then uh, they were going to go back to the farm to actually have dinner. But when he came he had uh, a translator, uh, his wife, and um, uh, somebody else. Anyway, uh, oh a secretary and then my grandfather also had a translator and my grandmother and then I'm the youngest of four I think I mentioned. Okay so there were the, our whole family, which was six. So being the youngest, I was the last one down the steps and everything else, and I go into the living room and there's no chairs left. Well, after enough of these people, I think I mentioned Nikita Khrushchev this morning, 
uh, enough of these people came to see Granddad, I didn't know who they were, and I just thought that they were friends of Granddad's, you know, just some buddy of some kind, because they always seemed to be very nice to each other. In fact, uh, one time uh, I came home from kindergarten, and, and I'd had a bad day with, with one of the girls. I think we had a little fuss over a blanket or something. And I told my mom, I said, I can't wait until I grow up and everybody gets along, and they're nice to each other. And she said, well, doesn't always work that way. <laughs> but anyway, so I go in and well, I, I just looked at him immediately and said, "Okay, this is one of my, this is one of Granddad's friends." So I went over and I sat in his lap, <laughs> and um, I started explaining all this stuff about the dress I was wearing because it was a handmade dress and there was smocking and lace and all this different stuff. So I was, I was explaining why these things were so important to him, and he he wasn't paying any. He was speaking French to his interpreter and talking to my grandfather. And, uh, it was as though I wasn't there, but I didn't care. I kept talking to him. <laughs> so finally, uh, my grandfather handed him a piece of paper to read. And out of his pocket, he took, he got these red horn friend Coke bottle glasses. And of course, I was a diplomat at age, whatever I was. I looked at him and I went, oh, why are your glasses so thick? And in English, he goes, because I cannot see poor, poor me. <laughs> and all of a sudden the room goes silent and you can tell everybody's, okay, so he does speak English, what have we said? <laughs> but anyway, and then uh, actually later on, um, when my grandfather passed away, he and my grandfather became very close. And um, he was halfway across the ocean before the invitations to the funeral even went out. And um, he, came into the, well, he went straight to the, to the Capitol Rotunda where my grandfather was laying in state and saluted his coffin. And that's one of my favorite pictures is, is of him, you know, the, you know his, the, the flag is on granddad's coffin and he's saluting them. Um, but anyway, he went from there to the Washington Hilton, which is where the family was staying. And uh, we had like a living room and we were all sitting in there and uh, he came to the, the door, um, he and his entourage. And, um, he walks in, and my grandmother started speaking some interesting French to him, I, I, and he answered her in English. He, he was just kind of past that. And um, then he pulls these red horn rim Coke bottle glasses out of his jacket, puts them on, looks around the room, and said, puts them back in his jacket, and he says, what a lovely family you have. <laughs> so he apparently didn't like to wear those things. But then if you go even farther to, um, the year 2000, when my grandfather would have been 100, my father and I went to Europe and kind of followed the footsteps of granddad, you know, England, uh, France, and all that. And in Paris, um, Charles de Gaulle would have been 100 that year as well. So at the Arc de Triomphe, um, my father laid a wreath to de Gaulle, and de Gaulle laid a wreath, Philippe de Gaulle, his son, uh, laid a wreath to my grandfather, which was kind of a nice gesture. But then we went back to where my grandparents had lived and it was now a private house, and but the map room was still in there. So Philippe, um, who looked just like his father, my father looked just like his father, it was like watching a couple of ghosts, um, went into the map room and started talking about the strategies of World War II, and uh, Philippe, you know, was kind of getting confused, and so he pulls these red horn room glasses out of his pocket, Coke bottle, and I went, oh, the glasses again. But I knew enough to keep my mouth shut that time. But then he, he looks at the map and he says, no, I think that was over here. And then he puts the glasses back into his jacket. So <laughs> I imagine his son has a pair of red horn red glasses. <laughs> I don't know. But he, he ended up a Navy Admiral, so they, they knew what they were talking about. But... What other questions do you have? Yes. Well, we talked last night, and there, there's something you said that was real, I thought really endearing. Most people here know that Eisenhower was very key on getting the interstate, interstate highway system in the 1950s. So we drive down the highway, you know, Interstate 80 or wherever, we see these blue signs with your name on them. What, what, what do you do when you pass those signs? Oh, <laughs> well, I have to admit, and I'm amongst all my new best friends, right? This doesn't go anywhere. Okay, no, I, I, I ride by it. I, do that to the signs. <laughs> Except there was one time in Birmingham, Alabama when there was a lot of construction and I had a near miss and I saw that sign, you know, Eisenhower Interstate System, and I went, and you too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I blow a kiss to it all the time. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and the, there's another sign now that um, I think this is kind of a funny story. I-70 goes, Independence, Missouri, where I live, is Harry Truman's hometown. Uh, everybody knows who Harry Truman was, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there is a direct line from I-70 that goes to Abilene, Kansas, which was my grandfather's home. So it crosses over the Missouri line, and recently the two libraries, or the two museums, got together and um, got it passed that it's now, that corridor is named the Presidential Parkway. And on the Missouri side, it's the Truman-Eisenhower Parkway, and on the Kansas side, it's the Eisenhower-Truman Parkway. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. I blow a kiss to that one too, even if Truman's on top. <laughs> Tell me a story about uh, what you discovered about your grandfather at school. You had to come home and ask him about it. Yeah, there were a couple of things. Uh, Granddad's skeletons fell out of his closet real bad one day at school. Um, but you know, we were we were a very close knit family, and we spent a lot of time together. And you know, I thought there was, I knew everything there was to know about him. And. Um, one of the kids said, you know, your grandfather's name isn't Dwight Eisenhower. And I'm like, excuse me? And he said, uh, he said, no, he's, he's David Dwight. And I said, he's not. Oh, yes, he's, he's David Dwight. He's not Dwight David. And I, I thought, you don't know what you're talking about. I know everything about him, and that's just not true. And then uh, somebody else chimed in and said, well, yeah, he was a Democrat when he was born. And I'm like, he wasn't a Democrat. No way. You know, so that day I came home from school on my routine, but I went, instead of dropping everything off at my house, I went straight to his. And at that time of the day, he was always in his nap room. And I came in and I said, Granddad, we've got, I, I have to ask you something. And he saw the look on my face and he put his book down and took his glasses off and said, What? And I said, Well, is it true that you were Dwight? that you're David Eisenhower and not Dwight Eisenhower? He said, oh, he said there were so many Davids in the family that I got tired of being called Bud, so I just took Dwight. <laughs> and he never officially changed it either. Um, it's still in the family Bible as David Dwight instead of Dwight David. But interestingly, my brother's name is Dwight David Eisenhower II, so I don't know how he's... <laughs> anyway, I don't know how all that works, but... <laughs> so, I, maybe he doesn't have an ide identity and just doesn't know it. But um, then I said, well, I heard that you were a Democrat when you were growing up. And of course, you know, I'd been so brainwashed at that point. I thought that was just horrible. Um, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> but anyway, we won't get into that. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, well, you know, he was raised a Democrat. But, um, you know, when he was in the Army, um, he was an officer, and uh, by tradition, they, they didn't vote for their commander-in-chief, so he, he didn't claim a party. And he said, and, um, I guess both parties, when he, uh, you know, when he was out of the Army and he was at Columbia University as its president, uh, both parties approached him to run, both the Democrats and the Republicans, but he was, he, he was a little more interested in the Republicans because the, the contender in the Republican Party was Taft, and Taft was um, an isolationist. He, he, he thought that the international things were uh, not important, that we could really survive on our own, and he was more into, you know, as I say, the isolationist. And um, he said, and this is a, you know, he, he got real relaxed, and he got this expression on his face like he was going to teach me something, and I kind of regretted asking him, but um, he, said uh, this is a two-party system in this country and the Democrats between Roosevelt and Truman, you know Roosevelt was elected four times and uh, Truman served one and a half, so it was a total of about what 25 years that the Democrats were in power and he said, um, he said uh, and I thought they'd been in power long enough. I said, hmm, okay, so what if you'd lost? And he said, how is your weight coming along? <laughs> so he never, he never entertained the idea of losing, so I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, yes. Trey, from Nebraska, what, uh, what was his favorite story to tell you about his life? Like, oh, well, um, 
he was kind of a solutions man. Uh, they they were um, termed, and it's kind of an old-fashioned term, but they were termed as coming from the wrong side of the tracks. You know, they were in the poor section of the town, and, and um, they they had no money, and all the boys, he was one of uh, six that actually grew up. There were seven boys, but one died as a baby. Um, they, they all took odd jobs, uh, and they farmed and things like that to, to make ends meet, to help the parents make ends meet. And um, one of his things that he did every uh, Saturday was um, he would take the vegetables to um, town and, and sell them to the wealthy ladies. And um, uh, my uncle Milton, who was the youngest um, of, the, of the seven boys, um, I think by the time my great-grandmother had him, um, she was like really tired of boys, so she dressed the poor little thing in curls and dresses. <laughs> now, if you go to the Eisenhower Library, they'll tell you that that's a Victorian tradition. My great-grandmother was not Victorian, and she didn't do it to any of the other babies. So <laughs> I'm afraid Milton was the victim in this case. But this particular Saturday, he's told me, and th this story had a lesson for me. It, it, it's actually a story of marketing and knowing your audience. But um, uh, Ida, my great-grandmother, had something she had to do. And she was a very strong woman. You can imagine raising all those boys in, in Kansas. Um, and she said to Edward, my grandfather, she said, you're, you're going to have to wash the baby. I said, well, they couldn't. They were going to go to town and sell vegetables. No, you have to watch the baby. I've got something I've got to do. She must have been burned out. I don't know. But anyway, she basically just kind of put the baby in their hands, and they said, huh. So they put him on top of the vegetable um, like wagon. They took, him to ta took Milton to town. And he was so pretty in his curls and dresses that these women just started flocking all over the vegetable cart and said, oh my god, what a gorgeous baby. I'll have two tomatoes and I'll have some green beans. And all that says so sales went way up and Milton became a regular part of the downtown trip. <laughs> Until he lost his dress at like age five, I think. <laughs> and I have to tell you uh, one backstory on Milton, too. Uh, he, uh, grew up to become president of Johns Hopkins University. <clears throat> and that was back in the day when there was like a best dress list um, in, in the Washington Post. And he made it five years in a row. He was <laughs> number five on the best dress list. Thank you, Ida. <laughs> How long are we going to go? Um, what, what would bother your grandfather the most about politics in Washington today? Partisanship, uh, the, the divisive nature, um, you know, I, it's kind of funny, um, I think it's ironic because back in his day, for example, Koch Industries, the Koch brothers in, in Kansas, didn't like Granddad because they considered him to be too liberal, you know, if, if that's, but one thing that he could always do was get along with both sides of the aisle, and maybe that's because he was raised Democrat and turned Republican. I don't know. Um, he was a very moderate person. And usually after the elections, um, you stopped being Democrat or Republican. You were American. And you got on with the business of America. And uh, that's almost an impossibility now. Nobody can do anything without, without getting their hands chopped off. It's just terrible. So I think that would be his biggest angst. Yes? You talked some before about Fascinating. You referenced it here a few minutes ago, but could you just talk to us a little bit about your grandfather's his ideas about integrity, honesty, and you, you kind of expanded on that last night. I think that'd be good for all of us to hear in this in 2015. Well, you know, like I said, even in the in the car story, um, you know, breaking the law and and lying were two things that he or deceit of any kind, two things he wouldn't. Um, tolerate. Another thing was uh, he, w he was very humble and um, I remember one time my grandmother uh, went to some kind of an event and it was kind of a disaster event and she came home and she was really complaining about it, judging the person that, that threw it. You know, I mean, my grandmother was a nice lady but she, was, she had a bad day, you know. And um, he turned around and he looked at her and he said, I want you to, he 
he said, just, just put your fist in a pail full of water, pull it out, and see what kind of impression you leave. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was one that registered with me. And another thing, too, um, one time uh, we were waiting for a car in, in front of the diplomatic reception room. And um, being a military man, he was always, like, right on time. And um, the car was late, so he's pacing back and forth, and he's kind of... You know, doing one of these and stomping his or tapping his foot, and my brother said, "Well, gee, Granddad, you're you're um, president of the United States. Don't you get anything you want?" And he turned. He literally did a military about face, blood red at my brother, and he said, "Don't you ever talk like that again." Hmm. So you know, he was very um, almost self-defacing in his legacy and everything else. And actually, that's one of the problems that the library has because he was so humble. You know, it, it wasn't like some of the libraries today, some of the presidential libraries where, um, you know, they're tooting their horns so much and it's almost a marketing process. Mm -hmm. he, he just didn't have anything to do with that. And um, so <coughs> it struggles to, to be known as a result. But he, he was, uh, if, if nothing else, the, the man was straightforward. You know, and loving. He was a great guy. Yes. Yeah. My name's Tyler. I'm from Idaho. And um, my question kind of goes along the lines of what Mr. McLean said a moment ago, but it's obvious that things have changed a lot since you know, President Eisenhower was in the office, you know, and just politically and, you know, just day to day, you know, we the people, you know. Right. But would you say, you know, judging by what, what you've seen him, you know, being his granddaughter, would you be proud of where we are as a country? I think you would. Um, and I'm not so sure he'd be real happy with our finances, um, <laughs> but I think he, you know, a lot of the things that really disturbed him, literally made him pace at night, have been resolved. And you know, I think he'd sleep a little better knowing that some of those things are are done. You know, like the reunification of Europe and um, you know. Uh, even, even uh, you know, he, he tried to warn against going into Vietnam. He was still alive when we first started to, to do that. Um, and I think that being resolved, you know, there, there are lots of good things that have happened since then. But um, in 1990, like I said before, he would have been 100, and we did several activities uh, involving them. He still had some staff members that were alive and quite able to travel, and that kind of thing it was a little while ago. Um, and one of the people that went was the assistant secretary of the treasury on one of the trips when we were in France, and um, they were telling stories on the left and right. I learned more about my grandfather that night. I think there was a little too much wine there. <laughs> but I, I learned a lot about my grandfather that night. Um, but he said that he was uh, in bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, and the phone rings, and it's my grandfather. And he's saying, something has to be done. Inflation went up half a percent last month. What are you going to do about it? He said, could we talk about it in the morning? <laughs> but anyway, they, they did. But I mean, he literally lost sleep over stuff like that. But I think it's because he came up with absolutely nothing. And you know, we were pretty prosperous in the 50s. And I think he didn't want to see that disintegrate. And I think he'd be sick about it now. <laughs> um, a follow up on that. What do you think he would, he would do different from the presidents we've got today to try to fix that? You know, I saw a commercial that that's reminded me of. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's okay. Um, I saw a commercial one time that reminded me of his philosophy, and um, it's it's if you don't have the money, then don't spend it. Why is this such a mystery? You know, and I he he would balance the budget. He he balanced the budget not only balanced the budget but in the black, and he was the last president to do that in the black. They've balanced the budget since, but it's always been in deficit. So, you know, he would he would cut back on government. He would cut back on the things that need to be, you know, he'd make the tough decisions. In fact, um, they stood to fall out of um, uh, balance, I think it was maybe, I know it was this last term, but I'm not sure if it was this last year. But he knew um, then that the military, for example, um, their clothing was provided, their housing was provided, and their meals were provided. And so he withheld um, a half a month's pay from the military to balance the budget. And they weren't too happy about it, but you know, he knew that they were going to live, sleep, 
and be able to dress themselves and go around. So he thought that was the best place to cut back, but that's what he would do. I mean, he would, I'm sure that he would kind of figure out. So he wasn't afraid to get on but a couple people, you know, ah, oh, why did you have to do that? You already get things done. No, he wasn't afraid of that at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Um, I'm Baxter from Kansas. Hey, um, where in Kansas? Hi, Walpa. Okay. Um, what did your grandfather do in his free time and time on some of his favorite activities? Golf. <laughs> I'm, I'm told he was an avid golfer. He was, uh, in fact, he even had a cutting green um, installed uh, on the White House lawn. And, uh, you know, I guess all presidents do a little something like I think the Obamas have a swing set for their kids, you know. So it just kind of, it, they personalize it. But that was what he did, and it's still there, by the way. Um, but uh, um, I'm told that um, he was a much better administrator at golf tournaments than he was player. <laughs> In fact, uh, has anybody here ever heard of Arnold Palmer? Okay, well he was a young, a young uh, uh, golfer. He was kind of uh, the Tiger Woods of the time. And Granddad invited him to the White House to, to play golf with him. And he, he tells a story, he said he was just so excited that he gets to the White House, you know, to play golf with the president. And he, he was like in his 20s, early 20s. And um, so he, he goes and they, they go out and they take their first swing. And he looked at Eisenhower's swing and said, oh my gosh, do I let the president of the United States win or not? <laughs> and he said, nah. <laughs> so, uh, but he, he was at with that, and he also painted, he, he, was a, he didn't like to be called an artist, he said he just copied what he saw, but he was a beautiful artist, he, he did a great job. Several pieces in the museum. Yes, there's actually uh, several on display, but there's uh, 200, a collection of 200 wow. in the museum. And I've got three in my house. Very nice. <laughs> Any last thing you want to say before we break things? Oh, uh, I just had a question. What, uh, what aspects of his character do you think helped him the most during World War II when he had to be in, he was in charge of D-Day, right? The invasion, or the landing. Um, I think, you know, I'm not saying that this because I'm sitting in the Midwest and I live in the Midwest, but I believe that his Midwest values and the way that he interacted with his neighbors uh, in times of trouble. You know, if there was a fire, the whole town fought it. You know, things like that. I believe that um, it was the values that he learned right here that um, helped him through World War II and, and to be diplomatic to all the Allies because there were lots of different personalities involved and he managed to get along with all of them. So I, I really think that that was his strong mother and the Midwest. Any parting words before we close this down? Absolutely. I, I, I want to thank your students, the faculty, everybody, so much for letting me be a part of your lives. I've really, really enjoyed my visit here, and, and um, y'all are wonderful, and I just uh, I just know that there's a lot of brilliance sitting in this room, and that uh, our future's in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. of the history of the college for you oh, and there's uh, gifts from the admissions office and we just want to shower you with your college <laughs> swag <laughs> about that so, so we hope you'll come back very soon <laughs>